Hello, everyone, and welcome to COVID pediatric pediatric vaccine update, the role of schools. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, we will be hearing from Shane Valentine and Dr. Tom Fu, and I'm very excited to be moderating this session because it looks like it'll be very interesting and important information for us all. And just wanted to reference the technical issues that we experienced earlier this morning. Thank you so much for bearing with us. Um, we should be working with much better bandwidth now, but one recommendation that we do have is that it will work best if you play the um, video from the bottom right hand corner in the standalone view. So without further ado, thank you so much and I'll be, we're going to get started. Thank you, Haley, and good morning, everyone. This is Tom Boo from the immunization branch at CDPH, and here's hoping no uh, technical difficulties. My slide is not advancing. Okay. Okay, so um, in fact, um, my my present presentation today is a bit more of a, uh, a general um, update on vaccination with some focus on pediatrics. Um, it's it's less focused on schools than the um, than the agenda would have you believe. But I'm fortunate fortunate to be joined by Shane Valentine today, who will uh, talk more about his uh, direct personal experience with vaccination in schools. So. Don't don't need to bore you too much with uh, with this slide of of the uh, vaccines that are available in the United States. Just to highlight that that uh, if we're talking about kids and schools, Pfizer BioNTech is is the only uh, vaccine that is currently um, approved and um, for for younger ages um, authorized under an EUA by the FDA. Obviously, for teachers and staff, there are other options, but the uh, Pfizer vaccine um, for for all age groups is. Uh, two doses separated by three weeks, and it's an mRNA vaccine. Wanted to uh, take, a, take a quick look at the, at the big picture. Um, basically, um, in, in the United States currently, 58% of the adult population is, is fully vaccinated. Um, if we look at just the eligible population, those uh, 12 years or older, um, although the younger kids are um, becoming eligible today, we believe um, we're, we're closer to 68%. Next slide, please. Similarly, in California, 73% of the eligible population, again, those 12 and up, um, have uh, been fully vaccinated, and another uh, almost 8% have been partially vaccinated. In other words, received uh, at least one dose. So. We, we achieved the 70% target that the governor set for us. Um, he, he, the, it was a June target and we, we achieved it in this. If we look specifically at, at kids between 12 and 17 years old, over 58% of kids have now been vaccinated. And more recently, booster doses have become a thing and, and the state has so far administered about 1.9 million third doses. So this is just uh, another look at uh, an adolescent pediatric vaccine coverage. And, and I think the, the highlight here is just the uh, tremendous uh, variability across the state with, uh, with darker colored jurisdictions having higher vaccination rates. And um, I think the heterogene heterogeneity, the differences between parts of the state is, is, is a theme, whether we're uh, looking at vaccination of, of, of kids or, or um, other vaccination disparities. But uh, again, 63.3% uh, of California's 12 to 15 year olds have received at least one dose and 57% are fully vaccinated. Looking at the 16 to 17 year olds, 71 and a half percent have received at least one dose and 64 and a half are fully vaccinated. 
And so that leaves 34% or um, just over a third of California's 12 to 17 year olds that are completely unvaccinated. Wanted to uh, touch on vaccine effectiveness as this has been kind of a uh, confusing issue with, with uh, boosters and breakthrough infections, et cetera. And there are real challenges in assessing whether increased breakthrough infections are due more to a waning effectiveness after vaccination or whether it's due to the advent, the predominance of the uh, more transmissible Delta variant becoming the dominant strain. Um, it's important to remember that vaccines reduce the risk of infection. They are effective at doing that, but they're even more effective at preventing severe disease. The effectiveness of these vaccines and other vaccines is somewhat less in the elderly. And we have learned that some people with weakened immune systems respond very poorly to, to uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. So as you may know, the effectiveness of the two dose mRNA vaccines in particular is uh, extremely, extremely high for preventing severe outcomes, hospitalizations and death. In California, we consistently are seeing 85 to 90 percent uh, protection against hospitalization and death with crude vaccine effectiveness uh, estimates statewide. And the effectiveness of preventing infection is somewhat less, and, and there is more evidence of waning over time. But currently in California, vaccinated persons are 10 to 20 times less likely to be hospitalized or die than unvaccinated people, and the risk of infection per se, any infection, including asymptomatic, likely four to eight times less among vaccinated people compared to those who are not vaccinated. I wanted to touch a bit on, on how our immune systems work in response to, to viral infection or to vaccination because the responses are, are uh, quite similar. Uh, among our white blood cells, the lymphocytes play a, a central role in uh, making antibodies and, and uh, protecting us from viruses. We've got B lymphocytes, some of you uh, may remember from, from school, which are, are mainly responsible for antibody production, which is um, in the old fashioned terminology known as humoral immunity. And then we have T lymphocytes with uh, different types and complex roles. Uh, a lot of different subtypes, and, and that's what we call cellular immunity. But they work together, the B and the T cell, the cellular and the humoral uh, immunity, parts of the immune system, to recognize and to respond to a new threat, such as in this case, SARS-CoV-2, SARS the, the COVID-19 virus. And it takes some time from, from the moment infection or, or vaccination from the moment our, our immune cells encounter the antigen of, of, of the virus, it takes some time, some, some weeks uh, for a mature and effective uh, immune response to develop. And so in the case of infection, you could think of it as being kind of a race between the immune system and, and the uh, virus, which is uh, replicating as fast as it can as the immune system is, is uh, striving to, uh, to ramp up and be able to produce antibodies and, and cellular immunity against the pathogen. And it, it's, it's essential to, to be aware that, that we have memory cells, B, both B and T memory cells, which persist after exposure to the pathogen so that we're able to respond better, quicker, if there is a next time, another infection. So the antibody response, there's a lag time, as I mentioned, between initial infection and antibody production. And antibodies are formed against a, a variety of different parts of an invading organism. And some antibodies are, are much more effective at, at stopping or blocking an invading organism than others. And, and that is what we call neutralizing antibodies. And, and in this case, uh, neutralizing antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 uh, bind to and, and block part of the spike protein that binds to, to receptors on our cells. And an important concept to keep in mind is that the effectiveness of antibodies at preventing infection depends on having large amounts or high concentrations of antibodies in the right places, basically in our, in our upper respiratory uh, tract where we, where we first encounter uh, the, the invite, invading virus. 
and and the and there have there has to be a lot of antibodies relative to the number of of virus particles or, or virions that we're exposed to, in order to completely prevent infection and block it. So, again, antibody concentrations matter, and um, our antibody levels naturally peak a few weeks after infection. A again, if if we're primed with a vaccine or previous infection, uh, we will our antibody levels will rise and peak uh, sooner than if we're exposed for the first time. But antibodies naturally decline over time, and most of our IgG antibodies have a half life of three weeks. So. Um, you can imagine that uh, the duration of a, of, a, of a completely effective sterilized antibody response will depend on what our uh, initial peak levels were and, and what the level of antibodies is that is necessary to block infection. But, but we also need to keep in mind that antibody levels in blood are generally not the same as antibody levels in our, in our nose and throat. Where, the, where, where they're needed to completely block infection. We don't need to go into detail on that, but just, just, the, just the concept that there are different parts of our immune system and, and antibody levels in the blood don't necessarily perfectly correlate with what we, what we need in our, in our nose and throat. Again, memory cells expedite immune response, having B and T memory cells primed by vaccination or prior infection, uh, dramatically cuts the time response to res the time needed to respond effectively. Antibody production begins more quickly after infection, rapidly augmenting existing antibody levels if you, if you have those memory cells. And then our prime T cells, they don't make antibodies, but they, they're very important in stopping, attenuating the progression of infection, keeping it a cold or, or a mild infection, and uh, keeping it from turning into pneumonia, for example, with infection in the lungs. And, and, and just to um, highlight that our immune systems over time are better at attenuating reinfections than preventing them completely. And the immune response to natural infection and vaccination are fundamentally similar. And in the absence of ongoing re-exposure to the virus, our, our bodies do not invest uh, the, the energy required to continue to pr produce large amount of antibodies. They, they uh, create these memory cells that, that lie in wait, ready to respond. With, with SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection, both vaccination and natural infection produce value le valuable levels of immunity, um, but the duration of immunity is uncertain. And we, we do know it is normal to expect that, that people vary from person to person. There's individual variation and that's normal, but there may also be significant differences according to the strain of the virus. Get a lot of questions about how does naturally acquired immunity uh, compare to, to the uh, protection uh, acquired from vaccines. And, and, and this can be quite controversial and, and different uh, countries in, in the world are approaching this in different ways, but, it, but it's, it's quite challenging. There's, there's a tremendous amount of research going on right now um, and, and studies are reporting varying results, but it appears that vaccination reduces the variability from, from person to person, that vaccination produces a more consistent level of immunity uh, than, than does natural infection. And that may have to do um, in, in part with individual differences, but also the severity of, of an infection, um, as well as as well as the variant. The variant, the, the different variants appear to induce um, uh, different different levels of immunity. And there's some evidence that vaccination actually provides better protection against more variants. It produces a broader immune response. And so CDC from, and, and the state typically takes our scientific lead from CDC um, and CDPH have, have yet to uh, embrace the concept that, uh, that naturally acquired immunity um, is, is equal to or can serve in lieu of, of uh, documented vaccination. Uh, there's, there's still more to learn on this subject. So as, as we all are well aware, um, the vaccination efforts in, in California and the United States, states face uh, significant challenges. 
Um, there are uh, a lot of disparities, differences between groups and, and areas, and we'll touch more on that in a second. And some of this is due to hesitancy and, and uh, vaccine resistance and misinformation. And I'd just like to note that there's substantial heterogene heterogeneity um, in uh, vaccine hesitancy and, and, and resistance. Uh, some people are, are extremely dug in. It's, it's, it's like part of their personal ideology, whereas other people are, are just um, um, uncertain, maybe a little bit scared, um, haven't had a chance to uh, get information from, from a source that they trust. So I think it's important to, to keep in mind that, that those people um, who are not currently vaccinated um, are that way for a variety of reasons. And then um, as we go forward, um, the, the state is, is not um, standing up mass vaccination sites at this time as we did earlier in the year. We're, we're relying more on, on uh, pharmacies and, and medical practices and, and uh, pop-up public health clinics and school-located vaccination. So, so more on inequities, because um, it's a central feature of the, of the uh, American uh, vaccination response. But uh, in California, we see, we see dramatic uh, differences uh, be, by income and, and what we call the Healthy Places Index, um, sometimes also uh, referred to as the uh, va vaccination equity metric. But uh, less advantaged, poorer, uh, less healthy places to live have, have still quite substantially lower rates of vaccination than, uh, than the wealthier communities in, in, in California. Um, there are unfortunate uh, differences by race and ethnicity. I believe the, uh, the, the difference in vaccination coverage between the uh, racial ethnic group with the highest vaccination rate, Asians in California, which is 90%, is about 35% higher than than the uh, rate associated with the uh, with with the lowest group, um, Black, African American, and, and uh, um, Native Americans are also um, relatively low. Um, stark differences by by jurisdiction and geography. Some of our urban areas, um, particularly Bay Area, uh, have have really impressive vaccination rates, and and the lowest the lowest rates we see are in some of the rural counties, particularly in Northern California. Uh, we're, we're very aware and working on um, stark differences um, between um, people who are Medi-Cal beneficiaries um, compared to California in general. Um, in my own county, the, the difference is about uh, 25 percent, um, the, the coverage rate between people with Medi-Cal versus people um, as a whole. There, there's obviously some political differences uh, with with um, people who identify as Republican Republican being less likely to uh, be vaccinated than people who who don't. And as alluded to before, um, some some really um, significant differences between rural and urban. And, and the state is ramping up some some efforts to uh, to do more to promote vaccination in rural areas. So, so now i um, swinging over to, uh, to focus more on, on kids, which I, I think most uh, participants of this conference are particularly interested in. Um, the, the pediatric burden of COVID-19 is uh, very substantial. Children are about as likely to be infected by the coronavirus, uh, but as we know, are much less likely um, to have severe disease. And, and in fact, uh, they're less likely to be tested, more likely to be asymptomatic and, and, and infections to, to go unrecognized. The American Academy of Pediatrics and CDC uh, state that there are currently between six and seven million pediatric infections that, that have been recognized. There, the estimates of how many kids have actually been infected are probably three or four times higher than that. But Although children have a low individual risk of severe disease, with so many children being infected, there, there have been over 8,000 children hospitalized with, with COVID-19 in the United States since the start of the pandemic. And the COVID-19 death rate for children is up above 790 now. And the, these figures don't take into account um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome dash C for children cases, and for those of you who haven't read about that, it's it's a it's a 
poorly understood inflammatory syndrome that occasionally occurs after some weeks, typically um, as long as maybe a couple months after um, a, a child or, or sometimes uh, adults, young adults in particular, have had COVID. And it involves uh, inflammation in, in a variety of, of organs, including uh, myocarditis. And it often results in hospital admission and, and often um, ICU admission and, and contributes uh, to additional deaths. And then um, if we're talking COVID, we have to uh, think about uh, long COVID. And the we do know that kids get long COVID. There are substantial, there are many, many children in the United States with persistent symptoms after uh, COVID-19. But the, the actual rate, the percentage of kids um, that are susceptible to long COVID is, is unclear. The, there have been a number of, of studies published, but the, but the rates um, are, are greatly variable. And of course, um, there are um, huge social and mental health impacts on children as, as there are on, on other uh, members of the population. There's been an epidemic loss of parents and caregivers with estimates of that over 140,000 children have lost a parent or a secondary caregiver like a grandparent or another relative. And of course, the mental toll is high. And, and I think we're, we're just beginning to try to understand um, the the extent of, of the adverse mental health effects of this pandemic on children's mental health. And um, many of America's children were struggling before the pandemic. So, so what are the expected benefits of, of pediatric vaccination? Obviously, first and foremost, we want to reduce child morbidity and mortality. And children do have the highest case rate in the United States and in California in recent months. There has been uncertainty at, at earlier times in the pandemic about whether children are very infectious to others, but we, we now know that children of all ages can transmit infection to others. Household transmission is, is often seen. And so indirectly, we know that reducing infections in children will benefit children, not only children, but also those around them in, in their people in their household and in their schools. And reducing infection rates in children will better enable schools to, to operate, to function in a, in a semi-normal fashion. And that's actually been specifically cited by a number of other countries that have embraced pediatric vaccination, the, the importance of, of vaccinating children to, uh, to keep them in school. Circling back to uh, to Pfizer vaccine, um, Pfizer is the only uh, vaccine that is uh, um, approved or authorized for, for people less than 18 years old. It is fully approved for 16 and 17 year olds as well as adults. Uh, and the uh, Pfizer emergency use authorization was expanded in May to include 12 to 15 year olds. And for, for both uh, adolescents and adults, the, the standard dose is 30 micrograms, 21 days apart. And just a few days ago, as, as I'm sure everyone is aware, uh, the Pfizer EUA was expanded again to include five to 11 year olds. The uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices of the CDC uh, is meeting now as we speak and, and their recommendations will be forthcoming uh, this afternoon. And the CDC director is expected to make an announcement sometime today uh, after which uh, the nation can begin immunizing five to 11 year olds. It, it's a different formulation, it's a different dose. It's two 10 micrograms, so one third the, the uh, older kid or adult dose, uh, similarly spaced 21 days apart. And again, separate formulations with somewhat different, different storage and mixing requirements. So it's, it's going to take uh, a certain degree of care on the part of us who are vaccinating uh, to uh, to give the the right the right type of vaccine the right dose to the right patient. Again, what we anticipate uh, the, the 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 steps are the the CDC will will make a recommendation um, which uh, presumably will uh, provide additional details um, on top of the uh, FDA uh, authorization. And then um, in, in the western part of the United States, the Western States Scientific Safety Review Work Group um, will, will meet and review the federal recommendations and add any nuances that, that seem appropriate for, for California, Oregon, Washington, and Nevada. 
There are three and a half million five to 11 year olds in California. We anticipate that about one third of parents will rapidly seek immunization and the rest will be slower to embrace vaccination as, as we have seen in other uh, population groups. Pri primary care providers, pediatricians, and, and family doctors uh, in the community will be essential to uh, providing vaccine access uh, to, to these children over time. And we do expect that following full FDA approval sometime next year, there will be a, a vaccination mandate to attend schools in person in California, and, and this will uh, play an, an important role in, in the vaccination progress. Dr. Boo, just a heads up, it's been 20 minutes. Hey, thank you, Haley. So I want to emphasize that pediatric COVID vaccination is effective and safe. The vaccine effectiveness in kids is comparable to that seen in adults. And this has been demonstrated recently in real world studies uh, with, with Delta predominant. And the, the Pfizer trial, which uh, has just resulted in, in the FDA um, eligibility expansion showed that in the short term, the, the vaccine is 90 to 91% effective in five to 11 year olds. And again, th this trial was uh, conducted in the time of Delta. There were no safety signals, no serious um, adverse events were observed in the, in the primary trials, but the trials only included about 4,500 children, which is too small for evaluating rare risks. Children can be expected to, to experience the same, uh, what we call reactogenic side effects in, a day, in, a, in the one, one, two, or three days after vaccination that other people may experience. So sore arms and, and uh, sometimes some flu-like symptoms. And th these are generally not severe. And, and this is a reflection of, of, of a normal immune response to the antigen in the vaccine. The only significant adverse event or safety issue that has been identified associated with the mRNA vaccines with Pfizer in children is uh, myopericarditis or cardiac inflammation. So inflammation of the heart muscle was recognized um, late spring as, as a potential safety issue and, it, and it's being intensively monitored in this country and, and uh, around the world where children are being and, and young adults are being vaccinated. And myocarditis is, is not a new thing. It occurs naturally, but it, it's, not, it's not common. But when it is seen, it is often a complication of viral and other infections. And natural, naturally occurring myocarditis also occurs more commonly in, in young males in particular, adolescents and young adults. And, and that's um, what we're also seeing in, in association with the mRNA vaccines. The severity of, of naturally occurring myocarditis uh, varies a lot from mild to life-threatening. And it's worth remembering that myocarditis is more commonly, much more commonly seen with COVID infection than it is seen with COVID vaccination. Fortunately, the severity after COVID vaccination is generally mild but it's still being intensively studied. We're, we're, we need to evaluate whether there are any uh, long-term uh, effects on, on any of the children. But currently most people, uh, kids and young adults recover quickly with minimal treatment. Many are admitted to the hospital, but uh, it tends to be uh, short hospitalizations with, with mostly uh, observation. And it is rare. It's usually associated with a second dose. Um, the uh, it, it, Israel, um, the Israelis are providing a lot of uh, very uh, valuable data related to, to vac vaccination, particularly Pfizer. They have high rates of vaccination and they, uh, they started early and they've been vaccinating children and they have um, healthcare systems that, that allow um, them to really track vaccination rates and, and side effects and, and effectiveness and breakthrough infections. So they've been publishing a lot of valuable data. And an Israeli study that was cited in the Pfizer application to FDA found that the highest rate is in males 20 to 24 years old. The rate in adolescents in Israel was about one in 100,000 persons. 
and then one of the uh, safety monitoring systems in the United States that involves uh, Kaiser Permanente and, and a number of uh, large, well-organized healthcare systems uh, showed a, uh, a rate in the U.S. of about five per 100,000 among 12 to 17-year-olds. The Israeli study, importantly, showed that the rates in kids 12 to 15 year, years old are about half the rate occurring in, in older adolescents. So that's reassuring to, to many people who hope that the younger kids uh, will, will not be affected, uh, even younger kids, five to 11 year olds will not be much affected by myocarditis. So, but it is unknown. Um, there, there's, there is decent reason to, to think that the, the risk will be substantially less. It's, it's myocarditis in general is, is less common in this age group. And if, again, if we look at the, uh, the rates of, of myocarditis in young adults and, and adolescents, it, it decreases with younger age. And also the dose used in kids is, is two-thirds lower, and, there, and there's, um, there's some thinking that, that uh, the, the dose of the mRNA vaccine uh, contributes to the, uh, the risk of myocarditis, which is one reason, frankly, that, that the Moderna uh, product uh, ha has not been authorized for use in, in younger children. There, there's some concern that the higher dose uh, Moderna mRNA vaccines may be associated with a higher rate of, of myocarditis. And so Moderna and the FDA are slow walking that one and getting more data. And, and again, no cases um, were seen in the Pfizer trial of about 4,500 children. And um, worth emphasizing that, that no vaccine in the history of, of the planet has ever been so intensively uh, studied and monitored as it was rolled out, you know, to now. There, there are billions of people in the world who have, who have received one COVID vaccine or another and hundreds of millions that have received Pfizer and, and the uh, vaccines that are used in this country. So, so the FDA um, and, and Pfizer estimated the benefits and, and the risks in five to 11 year olds specifically um, with, it, it, for, for this risk benefit analysis, they, they made an assumption that the, the risk of myocarditis uh, in five to 11 year olds would be the same as that seen in, in 12 to 15 year olds in Israel. But it, as I've just mentioned that, that uh, hopefully will not be the case, but their analysis showed that for every 1 million children between the ages of 5 and 11 who are immunized, 33,600 COVID cases will be prevented, 170 hospitalizations will be, will be prevented, plus additional MISC cases prevented, because half, half of those uh, MISC cases occur in the 5 to 11 year old age group. And with, with that number, for every, for every million Children vaccinated, 21 cases of myocarditis um, can be expected. With uh, 42, um, if 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 you if you uh, focus exclusively on boys, if, for every 1 million boys vaccinated, but the uh, the the benefits in terms of preventing hospitalization and and cases of COVID clearly outweigh the the small risks of myocarditis, which again is rare. We immediate hypersensitivity. We, we we know the risk of anaphylaxis uh, exists with COVID shots, as it does with uh, every every vaccine that we use. But in the in the real world, although the federal rules uh, require that people be observed for at least 15 minutes after vaccination, which is not something that is common practice um, with, with other vaccinations, but uh, Anaphylaxis after the COVID vaccines is 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 seen only slightly uh, more commonly than it is with with all the other vaccines that we're more used to, more comfortable with, such as flu shots. But vaccinators should be familiar with the treatment of anaphylactic reactions and should have access to epinephrine and and be able to call 911 if a severe hypersensitivity reaction occurs. Fainting and anxiety reactions uh, are considered uh, more of a risk with adolescent vaccinations, probably more so than with the younger kids. We know that, uh, that with any kind of shot or blood draw, fainting is, is somewhat more common among uh, adolescents, teenagers, than other persons. And so it is recommended that vaccinators serving this age group be prepared to deal with, uh, with a kid who's feeling faint after vaccination. And basically that just means having a, a, an easy convenient place where someone can lie down until they feel better and and there there's a uh, there's a link to a, to a job aid for 
easing anxiety during vaccination and decreasing the chance that people will have these reactions. Wanted to, to touch again on pediatric vaccine formulations. The, the 12 to 17 year olds receive the adult formulation, the adult dose. There are different vials. They're not to be interchanged. The, the, the vials are color coded. The, the younger kids, the, the new vaccine is, is, has an orange top. I've got, I've got a picture of, of different formulations in, in the coming slide. Uh, the, the, the amount of diluent of, of sterile saline that is added um, differs uh, between the vaccines. And the dose also uh, differs, the amount that's administered, the, not, not just the 30 micrograms, but you know, it's, it's 0 0.3 ml, whereas five to 11 years old, the, the 10 micrograms that the younger kids will receive is 0 0.2 cc. So as I mentioned before, I think we've all gotta be careful if we're immunizing a mixed population that we give the right vaccine to the right people. Storage and handling has been a major concern with the Pfizer vaccines, but it has changed over time. It's gotten easier to deal with. It is still shipped at ultra low temperatures and it may be stored in an ultra low temperature freezer, a special freezer uh, for the entire shelf life of, of the vaccine. There are differences when you remove it from ultra low temperature um, between the, uh, the, the five to 11 year old formulation and the adolescent formulations. Um, but, but basically, um, either formulation can be stored in, in, at regular refrigerator temperatures for six to 10 weeks after, after coming out of uh, ultra ULT. However, once you puncture that vial, once you, once you add the diluent or take out the first dose, all those vials have, have a six hour shelf life. And so wastage is going to be unavoidable in many situations unless, unless you uh, are, are vaccinating uh, substantial numbers of people um, in, in, a, in a clinic setting. So this is a CDPH uh, vaccine product guide. It's, it, the, the pictures are a little small, but you can see that the, uh, the orange top vial uh, is for five to 11 year olds. And um, they're, they're making some changes in, in the other formulation such that the, the purple top tube is, is currently, vial is currently available for, for older adolescents and, and adults, but uh, soon they're coming out with, uh, with, a, with a different um, gray top vial with different storage and handling requirements. So, Access, how, how are kids going to get the vaccine? We, we, CDPH has been making real efforts in, in uh, collaboration with the American Academy of Pediatrics, the California Association of Family Practitioners, the California Medical Association, and local health jurisdictions to recruit more pediatric vaccination providers into the state COVID vaccination program. When, when the vaccines first rolled out, kids weren't part of the picture, um, weren't eligible. And so a lot of uh, pediatric providers um, didn't pay a lot of attention, didn't, didn't, didn't enroll unless they were also seeing adults. But currently we, we have uh, over 4,000 vaccinators of, of children enroll and we continue to try to recruit more. There's been a real focus on trying to uh, enroll providers for the uh, vaccines for children or VFC program because uh, of the experience, the expertise that, that these providers have in, in uh, the storage and handling and, and reporting of vaccinations, but they also serve a diverse population to reduce the uh, equity barriers. Local health departments will continue to play a key role in, in many areas. It will differ from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Pharmacies have actually been providing most of the the COVID vaccination in, in recent months since, since more of the uh, community mass vax clinics uh, um, closed down. And some pharmacies are more comfortable than others uh, vaccinating younger children. And, and so um, there's, there, there's been some effort from, from the uh, national uh, chain pharmacies and, and, and from uh, federal government to encourage more, more pharmacists to, uh, to uh, be comfortable vaccinating younger, younger children. There's some, there's some training going on and, and that kind of thing for, for pharmacists who, who lack that experience. And importantly, 
we see school located vaccination of events as, as being of fundamental importance in, in reaching the uh, pediatric population who are interested in COVID vaccination. One, one reason is that not only will it improve coverage, but schools are a critical way to improve the equitability of, of vaccine administration. It's a, a school that serves a pr predominantly uh, disadvantaged population or a school that mixes um, rich and poor kids, kids of different races, schools are, schools are key. The best practice is considered to offer immunizations to students, family, and staff. Sometimes schools have, have found that uh, when offering it to students, there are family members that, that bring them in for the shots who just haven't gotten around to being vaccinated, whether we're talking flu or COVID, and it can be a convenient and, and, and safe time for other family members to get vaccinated. I, I didn't really touch on, on co-administration. I, I hope most people recognize now that there are, that it is considered completely acceptable to administer flu and other vaccination at the other vaccines at the same time as COVID vaccination. And uh, we, we hope that many school-based clinics will be able to co-administer both flu and uh, sometimes even other vac vaccines when, when they're offering COVID vaccination. And, and there are varied approaches to immunizing in school settings, and I look forward to uh, Shane Valentine sharing his experience. So um, pop-up vaccination events at school, this is the kind of thing I've been involved in when I was a, when I was a health officer. Um, some schools and districts have, have their own inherent capacity to implement this but there are uh, major efforts around the state to uh, to do this in partnership with local health departments medical practices and clinics uh, fqhc's often partner with schools kaiser permanente is well known for offering uh, flu shots in, in southern california pharmacies are getting out there to schools there are schools of nursing and pharmacy that uh, that come to schools and help immunize uh, children and, and parents and there are now a lot of uh, state uh, vaccination contractors, um, SNAP Nurse and Mobile Med and OptumServe are, are uh, being sent to schools around the state to, uh, to help provide uh, vaccination services on request. And I, I do want everyone who's associated with a school and potentially interested in, in um, pop-up vaccination um, services um, to, to be aware that uh, these state-funded uh, contractors are available on, on re, upon request. And then, of course, school-based health centers can have a critical role in vaccination. Again, just wanted to uh, touch on some of the state uh, resources that are available to assist with school-located vaccination. Either, either the state, the, the, the resources that I touched on already, or the local health, health department, LHD, local health department, may provide a team to conduct uh, school-located vaccination events at your school. Uh, you can request either a truly mobile clinic or, or kind of just a pop-up clinic, um, set, up, set up the clinic in the, in the gym or a multi-purpose room or outdoors if the, if the weather's good. The, the state is working very hard to develop uh, toolkits, webinars, and communication resources. Some schools are actually enrolling as COVID vaccination uh, providers themselves. And anyone, whether it's a health clinic or a school or a school district that enrolls as, as a COVID vaccination provider is eligible to apply funding to the CalVax grant program link provided there, which can provide uh, up to, I, th I think, $55,000, fairly um, flexible funding. It can, it can uh, reimburse for uh, time and expenses uh, associated with vaccination um, in the past or for uh, planning and preparation and, and, and vaccination going forward. The, the state has developed a uh, computer system for, for scheduling vaccine clinics, for registering people when they show up that also uh, performs the critical function of reporting to the state immunization registry that is that's uh, my myturn.com i think it's actually myturn.ca.com but either way if you type that in you'll you'll find it and there are plans afoot to provide uh funding for 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 some schools and school districts to hire uh staff to support vaccination not just COVID vaccination, but all, all the things uh, related to uh, vaccine mandates and, and reporting and, and exemptions. 
Wanted to touch quickly on consent for pediatric COVID vaccination in California. Parents are not required to be physically present uh, if, at the time of vaccination if signed consent is provided. Uh, parents and anyone else receiving the COVID vaccination uh, should be provided with vaccine information, which is uh, easily downloadable from, from the FDA. My turn uh, permits electronic consent, which, it, which is great. And, and I, I think within a few weeks, it will be um, allowing electronic consent for both COVID and flu shots. And interestingly, California also permits parents who are not present and who have not provided a signed consent to consent verbally, not by phone, but via digital video platform such as FaceTime, WhatsApp, or, or, or any other uh, smartphone or tablet or, or uh, computer device. Again, just to, to make another pitch that school-based health centers and schools and districts are encouraged to roll in MyCAVAX if they, if they wish to uh, uh, provide COVID vaccination. MyCAVAX is, is our vaccine management system. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to uh, minimize the uh, amount of time and effort that it, that it can take. You've got to be prepared to develop a, to devote a bit of uh, effort to uh, enrolling a little bit of time but there but there's great support available um you know at the at the other end of a toll-free line or, or uh, via email but uh the mycavax enrollment uh, meets federal and state uh, covid vaccination requirements and again um the grant program and then um the the the, the department the, the california department of public health maintains the easyiz.org website um, and, and uh, forward slash COVID has um, information about the grant program, about, about enrolling in MyCA Vax, handling of the vaccines, uh, eligibility, lots of job aids, um, education, communication materials. It's, it, it's a great resource both for COVID and other vaccines. And this is just a slide with with a, with a few of the links that uh, we we've touched on. And I, I I shouldn't I shouldn't fail to mention the Safe Schools for All Hub, uh, which is uh, a, a great uh, clearinghouse uh, center for for all things related to COVID in schools. And uh, Shots for School is an, is another um, valuable website resource, and. I think that's all I have. Most most of my uh, information today uh, came from uh, publicly available websites such as CDC, CDPH, EZIC, and uh, I also found the FDA uh, briefing doc document for the Pfizer application to contain um, valuable information. Thanks much, and I want to hand it back to Haley and Shane. Great, thank you, Tom. Um, Dr. Boo for that uh, presentation. And let me pull up my slides real quick. Okay. Uh, are we good? Can um, can we see my slide? Yep, looking good. Thank you, Shane. Okay, great. All right, so thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you, Dr. Boo, for that presentation. It was very informative. Um, and uh, I learned some, some things, too, through this. So that was great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to spend some time uh, with all of you on and taking the time to join this, this webinar on this very important topic. Uh, it's coming up all the time and, and now with uh, five to 11 year olds coming probably on board later today, uh, I think this is timely. Uh, I wanted to share some information with everyone kind of like from a boots on the ground perspective. So this is like an operational lens to that. So this isn't going to be clinically focused, uh, but more of like how and why um, something, you know, of uh, putting together this, um, you know, what does that entail? What does it take? Lessons learned um, and things like that. So, um, you know, so what does it look like? 
you know, first, I think it's really important that we all understand, and I think we know this, but I just want to reiterate the fact that, you know, school-based health centers are a trusted source in the communities, and leveraging that trust is key. So as I'll share through, uh, you know, some of this information and, and some of the experiences we've had since rolling out COVID vaccine pop-up clinics, especially in this instance when it became available to 12 and over, uh, of what did that look like? Um, so I'll do my best to portray what it looked like and how it plays out at my centers. I, I, I do want to also recognize that, you know, this is only our experience uh, at Lifelong um, Medical School-Based Health Centers and the communities we serve. Uh, it's not the only way to do it It's um, or the only way to consider. Um, every community, every school, every organization uh, is different. So I hope what you can do is if I does, if what I share with you doesn't exactly fit your needs or your situation that you can kind of understand thought processes. Uh, and this way, maybe you can come at it um, from one that fits your uh, situation. And, you know, we can share my information after, you know, anyone who has, you know, we can take Q&A obviously at the end, but uh, if, if there are specific questions that maybe I could help guide, um, I'm always happy to take those offline too. Um, so I, I can make myself available via my contact information for anyone who wants more specific uh, information. Um, so my goal is at this point is to share what is possible and why it is important. And I'll be as transparent and honest as I can. Uh, we had things that went really right and went really well. Um, and there are things that in that process we could have done better. And it was a learning process in in trying to uh, navigate this space. Oops. I think I lost my thing, one second. One second. Sorry. I lost it, sorry, one second. Please forgive me. Yeah, almost there. There we go. Sorry. Wrong button. Okay. Now, um, so from the top, what planning is involved? Um, it's a lot. And um, it's all about the prep. Uh, in this process. And I want to to share, you know, with all of you that, you know, from this, per, from my perspective and working for Lifelong, you know, we have a thousand employees uh, and, you know, I think 47 sites and programs across the East Bay. Um, so, you know, we were fortunate that, you know, we could leverage our organization and capacities to help us execute this um, because it does take a lot and is multi um, there's a lot of factors involved and a lot of uh, things at play that, you know, us at the health center site and our, you know, small staff couldn't execute by ourselves. But recognizing that and leveraging that, you know, we were able to still be able to pull off uh, some of these COVID vaccination pop-up sites, um, you know, when they first rolled out for 12 and over. Um, I will say that, you know, going through though, as we've gotten past the pop-up clinic, you know, events um, that we did institute when schools came back at our health centers that we had um, done in clinic pop, you know, uh, clinics uh, at our sites uh, during the week for a couple of hours on a rolling three week um, average. So, you know, we would do a site, we would do first, uh, come back, you know, open it up three weeks later for seconds, catch first at those, and then kept rolling on it. So we've been doing those um, to varying degrees of success, and success meaning like how many people we serve. They're successful in that we get kids vaccinated, um, especially the ones that have been families that have been hesitant through this process. Uh, but, you know, I think a key is that we're available. We're a trusted source in the community, um, and they may not have been an early adopter, um, as a family and have been hesitant, uh, but that, you know, they are still coming um, and which is very encouraging. Um, the logistics for staffing, consents, documentation, storage, et cetera, again, 
uh, for us was you know leveraging our team when we could and when we couldn't leveraging you know others in our organization to to help and mobilize um, there's logistics on the back end of like from technology perspectives like from a documentation of having laptops with my files because the clinic the tents that we set up to do them weren't necessarily that close to the clinic itself um, so making sure that the documentation was there, making sure that the check-in process was done, again, in those technology pieces, again, being honest and transparent, that was very clunky in the beginning for us when we did that. It was hard to get the mobile technology um, lined up with the needs that we had to serve, um, you know, getting on loan staff from other sites of ours and our COVID team to come out. It took a little coordination, but, you know, again, through all that, you know, it still was a net positive for the communities that we serve. Um, we proved to them that we could meet their needs, you know, when we needed, when they needed us to be there for them. Uh, and we continue to do that uh, for them. And I think that it's grown positively for us. Um, again, from an operations perspective, you know, the, us providing this as a, as an entryway to families that may not have had consent with us in the past for regular care, um, but granted consent with us to provide this vaccine to their child, you know, for their first time was kind of a, you know, entryway in to getting to know who we were on campus uh, and what offer and then to be able to engage in what other off uh, what other services we offer to help them, you know, whether it's medical, behavioral health um, or dental. Um, and so that there was then, you know, this influx after uh, doing these and continue to do these that, you know, families get to know who we are and, and how we operate in and, and what valuable resources we are for them and creating greater access to care. Um, the questions and concerns that the youth and family bring are the ones that we hear in the, all the time in the media, to be honest with you, um, you know, all the kind of misinformation and uh, you know, conspiracy theories, if you will. Um, and so what I wanted to share, like what we did was, you know, again, leveraging the trust that we have in the community and with our team that we've built, uh, we've offered um, like a parent Q&A um, town hall type session. Um, we've done a couple of those where our, you know, my lead clinician in school base, Christine Carter, uh, who has an amazing presentation on Thursday, I'll give a plug. Uh, on ACEs and PEARLS, um, you know, has a lot of information to share and knows a lot of these families and were able to communicate, you know, questions that they had, provide information similar to what Dr. Boo provided to us, um, and, and did it in a way where it was more of a dialogue. Um, we included members of our, you know, COVID task force at Lifelong. We've also engaged in those discussions and those kind of virtual town halls because they were held virtually. Uh, with other pediatricians uh, in the community that may not have been lifelong pediatricians, but are tr also a trusted source. You know, this is a, we, you know, we're all in this together. And so, you know, it, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if they get that vaccine from us or they get it from CVS or they get it from their pediatrician. Um, you know, it is really about getting through this uh, pandemic, whatever resonates best. And so this united front was something that we decided was important. Um, so, you know, we had a, so we had um, very, a pediatrician that wasn't involved with school-based uh, also join in one of these parent presentations. Um, you know, the follow-up question to that is, you know, it was, I would say decently attended for Zoom. Um, it was hosted by the school. So the invite came out from the school um, so it wasn't like uh, from a third party, if you will. Um, and so that I think helped that the principal opened up the session. Um, they were able to ask questions. They had a translation line um, that was offered through OUSD, Oakland Unified. So I, I think there's ways that we can kind of look at how, how to best leverage the information, the partnerships around the school uh, and the health center and the community and, and what are different ways that are gonna best fit the needs uh, of, the, of our populations that we serve. Um, I will be honest and say that we still had lower uh, vaccination rates among certain 
groups. But I do think that that doesn't mean like it's like a one and done. I think it's constant. Uh, it's inviting, and that they just know that we're very um, committed to this, and that they when they when they're ready, and we have you know answered enough questions for them that hopefully we can get them over the line. I think the lights went off in here. Um, so again, uh, to go like the questions that I said before, I think I'm going into the next slide there. Um, you know, is that you know, all this staffing and effort was like our staff that are school based, um, some of the other members of the organization for lifelong, uh, we were able to pull from to do that. And then, you know, the coordination is a little bit, you know, challenging and it does take some work. Uh, but I do think it's part of our, you know, mandate is what we're charged to do uh, is to provide greater access and remove barriers to care um, through schools and school health centers. Uh, what are we planning to do for five and 11 year olds? That's a really great question. <laughs> um, I will say that it is a, you know, we're still figuring it out. I think there's a meeting with uh, my lead clinician and some others at admin right now as we speak, um, trying to figure out what's the best way to do that, how to do it safely. You know, I think just for, just to put in perspective, and I know we all know this, but, you know, uh, little kids are not, little adults right a five-year-old is not just a small adult so there's a lot of care that needs to go into this and so how we did mass vaccination sites when this first happened um and looking at it now um you know i don't know if you get a bunch of five-year-olds in a tent outside and it's potentially raining and you know it's a scary needle coming and people are in mass so you know i just to take into effect that um while we'll figure out how to do that and make ourselves available and create access, uh, whether they're done during the school day or whether they're done on a Saturday, um, you know, is, is, is we're still playing out again. I will always, you know, like I said before, just be open and transparent and we do not have a perfect plan, but we do know that we need to, to do something and figure it out. And we're in active communications with the school, the district uh, and our own teams, quite frankly, uh, to figure out how to do this once, you know, as this approval is pending. And the last thing I want to say before I open up to questions uh, and come back to the presentation is, um, you know, I've heard it before in other uh, meetings with other school-based health center of, you know, when we do type of these type of clinics, you know, when we have to like, let's say, shut a clinic down for a day or half a day if it's done during the week, uh, and we lost, you know, billable visits and, you know, revenue, if you will, you know, so again, from an operations lens, you know, my, my, just my perspective of something to consider is, you know, while these are not billable visits to be able to execute on a COVID vaccination, um, I look at it kind of in a, in a way of it allows a f potential families and kids who do not have relationships with the school-based health center, who even know what we do and how we do it and all the services we provide that if we provide this service when they need it in the way that works for them, and we can then engage in a conversation with parents of all the other things that we do and how we can be a resource to them and their kids while they're at school, um, has generated you know more interest and general consent for us, not just consent for the to the for the vaccine. Um, so again, to consider you know maybe it's a little bit of investment of time and resources. Well, a lot of investment of time and resources. Um, but the but the long term benefit of growing the consent base at the school, um, getting new families to trust uh, the services we provide, and then having a longer term relationship with that family with all their needs, um, those billable visits will make up on the back end. If we want to talk just uh, operations in that aspect, um, taking that out of it, you know, it's us doing what's right for our communities because we're not going to get out of this unless we all do our part together. Um, and so that's just kind of my perspective. Um, so I'll stop sharing now and come back. And I think I'm good. That was great. Thank you both so much. Um, this was extremely timely and very relevant information. 
and I think we can get started on answering some of the questions that we've been receiving through the Q&A. Sure. Um, the first question is for you, Tom. Someone would like to know if the slides will be available for them to share with colleagues. Yeah, thanks, Haley. I I I, uh, I did share slides with, um, with with some of your colleagues, and I understand that they they're they're going to provide them as PDFs for people who are interested. So. Okay, great. Um, thank you. All right, next question we have: Would EKG clearance be a consideration for sports participation after a confirmed COVID infection? Yeah, I, I answered that in the in the in the chat or attempted to. Um, I, I think that's um, outside my area of uh, of expertise or, or, or comfort. I think I think I think um, the American Academy of Pediatrics might have some uh, some guidelines on that, but I, I don't see too many kids these days, and, and uh, I, I'm not comfortable with offering advice. Okay, thank you. Next question: What are some strategies that seem to work in addressing the disparities in vaccination rates that Dr. Boo cited? i.e. race, geography, medical coverage? Yeah, that's kind of the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, and um, I, I, think, I think also a little bit outside my, my area of day-to-day of -day expertise, but, but, but I, I believe that, you know, and there's a lot going on. I mean, there's, you know, there's, you know, people are trying incentive programs and, and, and sometimes it's access and, 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 there's, and there's real efforts to, um, to uh, you know, make vaccines available close to where people live and work in the under, under vaccinated areas. Um, but, um, you know, in communities where there's, you know, um, lack of knowledge or, 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 or mistrust or misinformation, um, I, I think it's going to be um, just um, labor intensive, slow, um, individual by individual work, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, nurses and doctors or, 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 or church leaders or, you know, um, there, there's real efforts to, you know, engage some some um, locally established and, and respected um, community-based organizations around the state. Um, I, I think I think you know the, the whole trusted messenger concept. Uh, you know of you know trying to educate people who can educate others. I, I think um, you know a lot of the um, a lot of the, a lot of the incremental progress is, is going to come in that way. And, and frankly, I, 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 I think there's emerging evidence that man, mandates do uh, make a difference for, for a lot of people, not, not for everyone. They, they, they make some people uh, dig in their heels um, deeper, but, uh, but they, they, they can help shift a lot of hesitant people. Yeah, I would agree. I'd like to just uh, piggyback off with Dr. Boo. It, it, you know, the, the thing that I've been trying to share with my team too is like there is no one way um, we're still dealing with, you know, some inequities even within our own schools that we are trusted, right? And so, um, you know, having a parent town hall or having an info session or having a one on like all, I mean, it's just, we can't just do a one handful of things and say, well, we tried. I think it's constant. I think the fact that we're still doing them and it's very visible that that we're doing them, like I said, um, just just kind of reiterating those. And I think, um, again, you know, peers too, you know, as we vaccinate uh, families and our friends with other families, I, I think, you know, those start, those start to help bring them, the, their friends along too. Um, so if there's a group, you know, of friends that are hesitant and one goes and then now sudden, you know, the other day, it was a couple of weeks ago, you know, my, my friend got it, so now I want it. So like, it's, I, I think it's a slow process. It's not gonna be light switches for us at this point. Um, you know, even with the five to 11 year olds, I think they said, I think you said like a third is gonna be right away. And then there's a third of uh, never, <laughs> right? So, um, and then there's a third in the middle. Um, so I, I think we're just in this for the long haul. And I think we just, we just can't really give up and just be, you know, trying to be open and accommodating and trying to find ways that will help people get to the where they need to get to. Okay, thank you. Another question is, 
Any concerns or pushback from school administrators and or FQHC leadership about conducting vaccination in school-based clinics? If so, how did you address? I, again, I can only speak from my experience in our schools and in our organization in our district um, here. Um, and I would say that none of that. I mean, it has been, can you do more? <laughs> and it's like, well, hold on a second. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I have not had that experience, um, and even my colleagues here in the Bay Area, or peers, I should say, peer group in the Bay Area, uh, I haven't heard a lot of pushback. I mean, it, it really has been the opposite of that question here. But 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 there 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 are areas where where it is a significant issue. I mean, I happen to live in rural California, and you know our school board's been beset with uh, you know with aggressive anti-mask protests um, recently to the extent that the uh, superintendent who's a you know I, I think a, you know a public health minded person is, is not comfortable um, with school located um, COVID vaccination right now she's she says what about just flu so so yeah I mean I think I think it's a we're a, we're a, a heterogeneous state yeah this question was answered in the chat but I'm going to pose it here so you more people can see the response how will schools be monitored to ensure that they are checking for vaccination status for teachers and students? Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think any of us in the immunization branch um, really know what that's going to what that's going to look like when it when it rolls out. Um, you know, probably for you know the following academic year, pending pending FDA approval of, of the vaccines for kids, but uh, don't know. I agree. That's not in in my purview as a health center director of, of how that's going to be done on the school district side. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and one question about if the study on myocarditis focused on boys in the five to eleven age group, how will we know the risks for girls in that age group? Oh, sorry. I mean, th there will be monitoring for 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 any type of of um, side effect in you know in, in boys and girls of both ages. Um, absolutely, we, we've just we've just seen that. I mean, myocarditis does occur in in um, in adolescent girls and, and young adults, but at a, at a rate much less than than boys. And again, that's true of growing myocarditis from from other viruses um, and and from the vaccine. There's something about young males and, and, and their hearts that makes them a little bit more susceptible to, to myocarditis. But, uh, but, but not just myocarditis, They'll, we'll be looking intensively for, for any, any, any signs of safety signals or, or, or other you know, adverse events. Thank you. Um, do you use any youth health educators or parent liaisons to get information out about the vaccinations? That's a great question. Um, Yes. I mean, when we did the, when the 12 and up came out, we did not have a health educator on staff. We had some AmeriCorps that did some outreach. Um, and we did engage a little bit with uh, parent liaison and parent groups. Um, but going into this uh, 5 to 11 we have a health educator on staff now. Um, and I think we could be a little bit more strategic about how we do that. So that's a really great question. And that's definitely a tool in the toolbox to leverage. Great. That actually wraps up all the questions that we currently have. But I wanted to thank both of you so much for sharing your expertise and providing so much really, really helpful information. Um, one last bit of housekeeping for all of the attendees is to please remember to fill out the um, survey that's going to be um, helping you to win points for gamification and to win something in the raffle potentially. So I have just sent a link to the chat. 